I'd like us to uh, turn in the scriptures to the New Testament and I'm going to read from the book of Ephesians chapter 1 first of all and then we're going to go to chapter eight, uh, chapter 5 uh, verse 18 but first of all reading from Ephesians 1 Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of the committee. Oh, by the will of God. To the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. My friend, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been chosen by God. Amen? just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. It couldn't be more clearer, but it goes on. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, I thought it was because of my will. But no, it's his will. It's the good pleasure of his will. But I thought I was the one who made the good choice. I thought that I was the one who looked at all the possible avenues of religion and I chose because I made such a good choice, because I'm so clever. No, my friends, not a, no chance. Because I'm not so clever, but he is so clever and so wonderful, and he is the author of my faith. He is the author. He is the one who called me. He is the one who predestined me. He is the one who elected me. He is the one who drew me to himself. What a glorious gospel this is. You see, and once we understand this, this changes everything. Because if I'm in the delusion of thinking that somehow I chose God, well, I might just well choose something else next year. No, 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 no. That's why the scriptures are clear. But this is one of the lost doctrines of the church. This is a pillar of the Christian faith. This is one of the pillars of Christian faith. But it's been lost modernism doesn't take this type of thing on board because very often it's not biblical. But look at this. Look how beautiful this is. Verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. He made us accepted in the beloved. It was nothing I did. It was something that he did. He made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. I mean, he is in charge, folks. He really is in charge. Amen. And last week, when we heard water pouring down right here, pouring straight down here, 
Evidence of him being in charge. Evidence of the magnificence of the God that we serve. He is utterly magnificent. He is utterly magnificent and worthy to be praised, worthy to be worshipped and adored. I mean, he is awesome. We use that word far too much these days. Did you see the game of football? It was awesome. No, my friends, the game of football was never awesome, never will be awesome. But God is awesome. He is magnificent and worthy to be praised. Let me say this. I want us now to go to Ephesians. I'd like, if we had a couple of hours spare, to read the whole thing through to chapter 5. But we don't have the time this morning. So let's just go straight now to 5. But I wanted to set it in context with his will. And chapter... 5 of Ephesians, then he says this. Um, let's read from verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. You walk circumspectly. That means to take account of everything, circumspectly, circumference, the whole of something, understanding the whole of a matter, weighing it all up from all the different sides, north, south, east, west, walking circumspectly, wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming is interesting in the Greek. It says this, in the Greek it means, or the inference in the Greek is recognizing the future gain. So redeeming, because we recognize that if we redeem the time, there is a definite future gain for us in redeeming the time. Not just allowing time to slip by, not just allowing time just to drift on by, but redeeming the time for God, for godly things, for the purposes of God in our lives. It says, because the days are evil, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And this is the verse I want to focus a little bit of time on. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Verse 17, just to go back, it says this, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Well, what's the will of the Lord? Well, we just read a little bit of it in chapter 1. It's his salvation. It's his call. It's his faith. It's everything from him. He has elected us. He has adopted us. It's from him. He's the author of it. That's his will. That we walk in his ways. And then he says this. It says this. It says, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Very provocative. I mean, this is the Holy Scripture, and it's saying... Do not be drunk with wine. And it's using, in the next phrase, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, it's saying this. Just as you can be drunk with wine, you can be filled with the Spirit. Just as you can be under the influence of alcohol, and just as the influence of alcohol can consume an entire person, the influence of the Holy Spirit can consume an entire person. It is possible to walk full of the Holy Spirit through life. 
Just like some people live drunk on alcohol their whole lives. Okay. How do they get drunk on alcohol? They drink alcohol. They are focused on alcohol. I've heard these people talk who are alcoholics, you know, and their day is orientated around the next drink that they can buy. Everything is focused around the drink. I mean, they go somewhere. Is there a shop there? Is there a, I need to get my alcohol. We're going for a weekend in the country. Is there a shop close by? I better stash up on my alcohol now so that when I'm in the country, so I'm going to have plenty to drink there. I mean, everything is focused around the alcohol and the cons consuming the alcohol. And the scriptures are saying to us, instead of being someone who's like that, God's will, God's directive for us who follow Jesus is that we would be consumed, a passionate, consuming desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, let me ask you, what was God saying when we hear the water pouring down last week? God's saying, I'm willing for you to be filled. There is no shortage of supply. No shortage of supply. But there is a shortage of people who yield. I hope that we're not going to be counted in that number. We have an opportunity to yield to the filling of the Holy Spirit, to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Well, let's go back to what the scriptures talk about, the drunk person. A person who is drunk, you know, when someone gets drunk, they are totally drunk. You don't have someone drunk on their left side, but their right side is fine. Or their legs, you know, are totally drunk, but their mouths are okay. They, they, they're walking like this, talking perfectly fine, but they are walking around like this. That doesn't happen, does it? No. If they're drunk, they are completely drunk. It affects the whole of their person. They, it, everything is, you know, and, you see, and everything is affected. Same with the Holy Spirit. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, everything's affected. My speech is affected. My speech is affected. Everything is affected when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I wonder if we can have these slides up. We're going to try and see if we can put these slides up. Now, let's see if we can have the slides up. The slides that show the diagrams on the chair. Okay. The other one. The self-directed life, just below it, that's it. Look at this. This, this, is, this is what some lives look like. So some lives look, you see, the S stands for self on the throne. Self is on the throne. And these are the clues that self is on the throne. Legalistic attitude. You see people that have legalistic attitude all the time. This and this and this and this and you did this and they did that and I'm this and, and you're not this and this and it's a legalistic attitude. You, see, you know, this, this, is, this is one of the fruits of someone who has self on the throne. They have jealousy, impure thoughts, guilt, worry, Discouragement, critical spirit, always criticizing people. You know someone like this because they just don't get on with people. They're always criticizing, they're always, you know, they've always been hard done by, everyone else is wrong. Frustration and an aimlessness. They have an ignorance of their spiritual heritage. There's an unbelief there. They just don't believe. 
You say to them, have faith in God and believe God. I said, well, I don't know if I, I just, I just, I'm not. There's no faith there. Because self is on the throne. Everything in their lives is orientated around themselves. It's all about themselves. There's disobedience. There's a loss of love for God and others. They're not that bothered about other people. They're very concerned about themselves, though. They have a poor prayer life. It's no intimacy with God. And no desire for Bible study. The Bible doesn't excite them. When we're followers of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ writes a letter to us, our letters to us, it, it's not hard to want to read them. I tell you the truth. When I met Micah, she lived in San Francisco. And I lived in Wales. And, in fact, I also lived in London. I had a flat in London. And I didn't have email at the time. But I had a postal address. And I gave her the postal address. I tell you the truth. Whenever the post went... Whenever that postman had pushed stuff through, I was like a, you know, like those little dogs, they run to the post. They want to find out who's there. They're looking at the post letters. I was like one of those, checking to see if a letter had arrived. I wonder if there's a letter that she sent me. Maybe she sent me a letter. And on the odd occasion, there would be a letter from Micah. And when a letter from Micah arrived, I'll tell you the truth. I'm going to be real honest. <laughs> I would open it up very slowly. I'd look at the envelope. I'd look at the way she wrote my name and detect something in that. And then I'd spend some time looking at the envelope. And, and then I'd, I'd, I'd read the letter. Would I read it once? Have a guess. Take a wild guess. <laughs> no, I wouldn't read it once. <laughs> no, no, no. I'd read it over and over and over and over. And then I'd be thinking on it all day long. Oh, I'd be thinking on it. And then I'd go out to the shop and I'd have the letter tucked in my pocket. And I'd have a nice coffee. And then I'd take the letter out and picture what she was doing. And I'd read the letter again. And then I'd put the letter back in. And then I'd, oh, it was beautiful. Letters from Micah. Beautiful. Of course, when email came, all the better. In fact, I said to the man, I went to the computer shop. Oh, I said to the Lord, I was in prayer. And I said, Lord, I'm not going to chase her anymore. She'd give me the bit of the cold shoulder, really. And, I, and so I said, I'm going to spend a week in prayer and fasting. I'm going to do some business with God. And if it's God's will, then it'll happen. But I'll need a sign from you, God because I'm not going to chase her. I'm ministering the gospel. I'm not going around chase. you know, I have to be careful. So I said, okay, just one sign. So my friend phoned me up. He said, that girl, Micah, who you met in San Francisco, she asked if you had an email address. Oh, I said, what? She wants my, okay. I went straight to PC World. I said, I need to buy a computer right now on one condition that you give me one of those email addresses. Can you fix me up with one straight away? He said, yes. I said, great, I'll buy the computer. And he gave me my email address. And, you know, and that's how that started. But the point I'm trying to make is this. I wanted to read the emails and the letters. When you get a Christian who doesn't want to read the Word, they're not excited about the Word of God, that tells me they don't love Jesus. How can you love Jesus and not love his word? You're joking. If you love the Lord, you want to know what he's saying because it's, a, it's his love words to you about your future, about your destiny, about your potential. God has a great potential in us and he reveals it in his word. How, how's, how are we going to live for Christ if we don't know what he says? Come on, I mean, that, that's not going to work, is it? 
No, my friends, listen. If we are following Jesus, then we have to really be studying his word, finding out what he says. Let's put the other slide up here. Thanks. The Christ-centered life. Let's let's compare it with the Christ-centered life. Look, Christ-centered, empowered by the Holy Spirit. This Christian life, we have to live it empowered by the Holy Spirit. Introduces others to Christ. I mean, let me ask you this one. Do you have a desire to introduce people to Jesus? Is, Is that a desire for you? If it isn't, there's an issue there. Because all Christians, the Bible points to the life of the Christian being a life that wants others to follow Jesus and a life of witnessing. Jesus says, you will be witnesses. Who's he talking about? All those who follow him. Effectual prayer life. A prayer life that really makes an impact. There's an effect Understand God's word, trust God, obey God. And then, of course, there's fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness. But look at the key for this life. Instead of the S on the throne, it's Jesus on the throne. Jesus is in charge. And this is the key question. Who's in charge? Is it self on the throne of your life? Or is it Jesus on the throne of your life? The big decisions that you make in life, the big decisions that you make with your time, with your resources, with your talents and your gifts, are they for Christ or are they for self? Do you want to spend time on self or do you want to spend time for Christ? I believe that for us to be all that God wants us to be as a church, obviously we need a church of people who are committed to spending time for Christ whether it's in out-and-out evangelism, with handing out of tracts, speaking to people. I, by the way, I suggest that everyone who's a Christian ought to be able to carry a tract at, at the very least and then offer a tract to someone. And with that in mind, I hope we've got enough tracts out there and I would encourage everyone, please take a tract away today and have a read of it at least. And get those scriptures so that we can be aware of how to lead people to Jesus. Let, let, me t- let me explain it like this. This is God's will for us. This is what God wants us to do. When Jesus is on the throne of our lives, this is what happens. You see someone who's putting prayer in the forefront of their lives. The word of God in the forefront of their lives. Uh, worship to God in the forefront of their lives. Christ in the forefront of their lives. If you see someone like that, you'll see someone who wants to evangelize. It just, it just flows out. You just want to evangelize. But when you see someone with self on that throne, ah, evangelism, it's a good, it's a good idea. Yeah, I'm not called for, to be an evangelist. My gift's in other areas. Yeah, I've heard it all before, haven't we? We've heard it all before. Listen, we need a passion for the gospel of Jesus. This is the greatest truth ever given to mankind. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, it's gone out of fashion. I don't care. I don't care. We sang the song at the beginning, didn't we? Onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. The Bible says we're in a war. It's a battle. There's the world going this way and there's the Christians going the opposite direction. Always has been like that, if the truth be known. Oh, we build up romantic ideas of what it was like in the past, but the truth is it's always been the same, really. You always had the world going this way 
and the few that find Christ going in the opposite direction. Brothers and sisters, we are of that few this morning if we trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And what I'm saying this morning is this. If we trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, we must follow him as Lord and Savior. Who's on the throne of your life? Is it self or is it Christ? If Christ is on the throne of your life, your will comes secondary. And Christ is the paramount. And the question this morning is this, and this might be for several of us here this morning. There are areas of life that haven't been given over to him. Areas that we need to give over to him this morning. He wants us to surrender areas of our lives this morning and say enough is enough. I've seen the plaques on the wall. And if there was a plaque of my life on a wall somewhere at some point, not that we would desire that, but if that was to happen, let that plaque say, there was a person who followed Jesus like a soldier in an army. Let that plaque say that. Let's say we were faithful to what the word says. Let's, let it say that we were yielded to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brother, can we? And as we close this morning, I want an opportunity for us to respond, really, in prayer. Because, look, this isn't even about, this isn't about us. It's not about us and us having, you know, winning brownie points or something like that with God I mean in a way it is about us because there's rewards and there's all of that to take account of but my sense this morning is that there's people that we know in this place this morning there's people that you know who really need to hear the gospel they really really need to hear the gospel I, I was so upset when I heard there was a young mother with I think it was three children just up the road this was last year in a school a young mum three children she couldn't cope with life the poor darling she committed suicide I believe what we have is the greatest truth ever given to mankind as a church we're trying to facilitate evangelism as best we can we've got those tracts are you elect printed we heard a beautiful testimony of how they were used earlier in this service please take tracts hand them out I handed some tracts out yesterday some people didn't didn't enjoy receiving them not everyone will say great this is tremendous thank you so much but I don't, uh, what does that matter? I've been called as a follower of Jesus to be faithful to the gospel. I want to hand tracts out. I want to witness to people. I want to win people to Jesus. The greatest truth on planet Earth is someone coming to know Jesus as Savior. Nothing like it. A, a million pound in the bank, 10 million pound in the bank, nothing. That's, that's, that's nothing. When we die, we won't take any of that with us. It's a temporary thing, it means nothing. But the riches of Christ, his beautiful gospel, now you're talking. And it's free. And it's for all. Young and old and everyone we have an opportunity to give this great gospel. We have been entrusted with the gospel, my friends. Oh, brothers and sisters, stand with me this morning as we close. Please, everyone, close your eyes in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, 
we come before you now in prayer and we want to respond Lord to what the Holy Spirit has been saying to us this morning my friend if you've heard from the Lord this morning if you've sensed his voice speaking to you specifically this morning I invite you to lift up your hand and respond Maybe you're going to respond about evangelism, carrying tracts around. Maybe it'll be something else. I don't know. A yielding in an area of life. Maybe you've got questions. Come this evening. We're going to explore more this evening on this subject. But I want you to respond to him now. You're responding to God now. So respond to him this morning and say, if I've had self on the throne of my life, Lord, I don't want self on the throne of my life. I want my time, my resources, my life to be used for your purposes from this moment on. If that's you this morning, please lift up your hand and respond to God right now. I see hands being lifted up. And if for some reason you're not responding in that area, you respond to God this morning according to what the Word has been saying to you. And let the Lord's will reign in and through our lives. And let this be a place where the gospel shines bright. Heavenly Father, we commit ourselves to you we commit ourselves to you then in Jesus' wonderful name now. You've seen hands that are raised and others are speaking to you in their hearts. Father, we respond to you this morning in faith, saying, Lord, we want your will for our lives. We want your will for our church. Father God, have your way in and through us then. Oh, Lord, that our lives would be a testimony to Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Let our lives be a testimony to Jesus Christ. Father God, we worship and honour you and praise you today. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. I want to have a moment now of prayer for something else. This gospel that we have spoke about this morning is a gospel of power, not of words. Paul says, I don't come with wise and persuasive words, but a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Part of that power manifests in healing. I want to invite people this morning, if you have a need for healing in your life, physical healing of one kind or another, I'm going to invite you to respond. Ask God to minister to you right now. Just lift up your hands. Just lift up your hands to the Lord. Apostle Paul wrote, I wish that men everywhere would lift up holy hands. Men and women lifting up their hands. It's a sign of openness. More Holy Spirit. More. More. Thank you, Father God. And if you need healing now, you ask the Lord to heal you in that area. Father God, you hear people's requests right now. Lord, I ask that you touch those bodies with your healing virtue in Jesus' holy name right now. Right now. Come alive. Come alive and come quick. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, praise his name. Praise his holy name. Thank you. Thank you. 